Grace and peace to you again in Jesus' name, amen? amen. So today's message is going to be, um, well, it's going to somewhat dovetail with what we've been hearing during Lent and Wednesday services, specifically with what those who've been coming on Wednesday heard a couple weeks ago on Wednesday, February 28th. So if you've been coming, part of this message is going to sound a little bit familiar to you. And if you haven't, well, let me just bring you up to speed uh, with where we've been on Lent Wednesday. So this Lent, we've been moving with Jesus all the way from the Garden of Gethsemane when just after they left the upper room, and we're moving all the way to the cross and finishing up there on Good Friday. Now this week, we're looking at the story that we just heard in the gospel, according to John, of how Judas betrayed Jesus. Looking at that whole kind of scene, if you will. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we really gave special attention to Judas and betraying Jesus in the garden. And today, we're going to listen to the whole events that surrounds the story. But we're not just going to do it from the gospel according to John. We're going to do a harmonizing of the gospel. So what I've done is I've taken all four gospel accounts, the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then pairing in the gospel according to John and taking all those stories and putting them together into one and making one harmonized message. Now, you could open up your Bibles to the Gospel according to John and try to follow along, because a big chunk of this is coming from that, but there are parts that are going to be woven in from the other three synoptic Gospels as well. I will put the words on the screen for you to follow along with as the harmonizing of the Gospels go. And we hear this. And even as Judas said this, or even as Jesus said this, excuse me, Judas, the betrayer who knew this place, because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They'd been sent by the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with the kiss. Then you can take him away under guard. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to meet them. Judas, who had betrayed him, was standing with them, but as soon as they arrived, walk up to Jesus. Rabbi, he explained, exclaimed, and gave him a kiss. And we heard these words again from John. From, who are you looking for? Jesus asked the guards. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. As Jesus said this, they all drew back and fell to the ground. This is the first portion of it. We're going to look at the second portion of it just in a bit. Now, as our Wednesday night group had been hearing a couple weeks ago, this one little moment, this scene within the whole scene, if you will, is dubbed by philosophers and religious scholars alike as a time known as the Mysterium Tremendum, a very fat, fast, uh, you know, uh, just, it's a fancy Latin saying, right? And that Latin saying essentially means the terrifying mystery of the ultimate reality. For in that moment, the incarnation of heaven, a.k.a. Jesus Christ, revealed his absolute authority by declaring, I am. Jesus is saying, I am that I am. This is the very same I am that would hearken us all the way back to the book of Exodus. To where Moses meets the Lord God atop of Mount Sinai and from the burning bush when Moses asks, who is it that I shall say that has sent me? We hear, I am. This is that very same construct. So Jesus is telling the guards, the soldiers, Judas and his disciples, everyone present in the garden that evening, I am he who spoke to Moses from the burning bush. And the moment Jesus said, I am, it's as though a shockwave went out from his voice and they literally all fell to the ground. It is as though they are hitting their knees in a posture of prayer amid the presence of the universal great I am. That's what's been going on. That is the mysterium tremendum that's happening here. 
And in this moment, not one person could stand in the presence of the divine presence of the Son of Man. They all had to fall in posture in his presence, including Jesus, including the Roman soldiers, and especially the temple priests. The reason I bring all this up is Jesus' statement of saying, I am, is the crux of our entire message this morning. Everything hinges upon this. Because in addition to many other things that's going on in this passage, it really informs us of the ultimate reality and the ultimate person who's in charge that evening. And it wasn't Judas. It wasn't the disciples. It wasn't the Roman soldiers. And it certainly wasn't the temple guards. This is Jesus declaring to them that I am is in charge. Okay, let's cut to the chase. Because what we're looking at this weekend, what the children were looking at in Sunday school, is Judas betraying Jesus. We know this story. We hear it practically every year. I think it's probably safe to say that a lot of us have probably felt betrayed at some point in time in our life. Maybe you've been betrayed by a family member or a close friend. Maybe a coworker. Maybe a teammate. Maybe you've felt betrayed by a pastor in the past. As pastors, sometimes we feel betrayed by our congregants. It's a part of the human condition. To some degree, we've all felt betrayed at some point in time in our life. We've had our trust betrayed. Whether it's in a really tiny way or a huge blown-up way, there's times when we just feel like we've been betrayed, and sometimes that ruins relationships because of the betrayal. But we have to remember here who's at the center of this entire scene. we got to remember who's the central focus of this message. And it's Jesus, right? And because of that, we really shouldn't give any undue attention, any more attention than it deserves to Judas or the betrayer or the fact that he even betrayed Jesus. Because when we focus on the Judases of our lives, right, we're really taking our eyes off of Jesus. And we're really giving more attention to the negative and to evil than it absolutely deserves. And that can be a huge distraction for any of us. Wouldn't you agree? I think it's wise to recognize that in, in moments like this that happened for Jesus, that when we, you and I, when we feel betrayed, right, we should really ask ourselves, why am I feeling this way? Why, why am I feeling betrayed? But we shouldn't do so at the cost of taking our eyes off of Jesus. Because Judas did that. Judas took his eyes off of Jesus much earlier in his walk with Jesus. Maybe he thought that Jesus just wasn't living up to his expectations of, of who Messiah should be. Maybe Judas believed that Jesus was going to somehow overthrow the establishment and the Roman Empire and usher in some type of material kingdom where he would um, financially benefit, if you understand my drift. Judas was all about the money. We know Judas was a thief. When he saw that Jesus wasn't living up to his expectations and, and wasn't the man that he thought he was going to be, Judas betrayed him. But Jesus didn't give Judas any more attention than he deserved. But he's not the only one. Peter also took his eyes off of Jesus. We hear this later on in the story as Judas, excuse me, as Peter, excuse me, fought back. We, we know that story, right? Peter takes his focus off of Jesus. He sees the chaos surrounding him, right? And even when Jesus is kind of telling him, back off a little bit, right? Judas, Peter, my brain is like flipping names this morning. I apologize. But Peter takes out his sword, right? And he slashes off the ear of Malchus the temple servant. He did that because he wasn't focused on Jesus. He was focused on the chaos surrounding him. 
It's just good to remember that the disciples were as human as the rest of us. They often took their eyes off of Jesus and, and off of the bigger picture that was happening around them. You think about it, Judas and Peter were only a couple players in this entire scene. But at its center was the incarnation of God who was fully in control of the entire situation. To understand that, we got to go back to what John said. Let's look at that moment when the Apostle John recorded Jesus' words as we hear them in the Gospel according to John, chapter 18, verse 9. Now we go back to our Gospel message for this morning. And we hear the harmonizing of the scene concluding in this way. Once more, Jesus asked the guards, who are you looking for? And again, they replied, Jesus the Nazarene. Again, Jesus says, I am he. Again, hearkening us all the way back to God in the burning bush. And then he said this, and pay attention to these words. He said, and since I am the one you want, let these others go. And then John puts this parenthetical statement in there. He says, he did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those you had given me. And then Jesus, looking at Judas, said, my friend, go ahead and do what you came to do. Go ahead and do what you came for is the literal word. It's interesting when you think about this scene, this, this time, right? Judas, the temple guards, the Roman soldiers, they thought they were fully in control of what's going on. But Jesus' words that we hear throughout this entire story, especially in this mysterium tremendum, say otherwise, right? When Jesus says that I am, and they all literally fall down and have to bow and posture to Jesus in his presence, that tells us of the one who's really in control, and it was Jesus. Judas thought they were in control because they came to apprehend Jesus. But it's really Jesus who's saying, I'm giving you permission to take me. Jesus gave himself over to the guards in order to fulfill the prophecy. But that's not the only part of it. Because as the great good shepherd, Jesus guarded his own from being apprehended that evening. Although Jesus was being taken by force by the temple guards, he guarded his disciples, thus not allowing the guards to take the disciples by force. Jesus wasn't making a request of the guards. He was using his words with a tonal inflection that commanded authority, with an imperative command. Jesus was basically saying here, I'm allowing you to take me into custody, and furthermore, you're going to let my disciples go unscathed. Now, we don't pick up that nuance in the English. But when you look at how the Greek verbiage is being used, especially the, the syntax, the context, the, how the, verb, the Greek verbs are ending, which is far more complicated than the English, we would see an affirmative exclamation point behind, let them and go. There's two exclamation points in there, and they kind of build one another up. Jesus is telling them, I am that I am, and I'm in charge here, and while you think you're in charge, these are my boys, and you're not going to touch them. You're going to let them go. That's what's going on here. This is God we're talking about, right? Right? This is the great I am telling his created ones what he fully expects them to do. And all of this we're hearing is wrapped up within the context of, of Jesus declaring to the Father through prayer that he's not going to lose a single soul. Or stated another way, that he would guard their lives. Every single one of them that the Father gave them, except for the one that was destined to do what he did, and that was Judas. Earlier that evening, before they got to the got to the Garden of Olives, right? To Gethsemane. 
In the upper room, Jesus had a long prayer. And in that long prayer, we hear his words as they are recorded in John chapter 17, verse 12. Give me a moment to open up my Bibles and get there. We hear this. John chapter 17, verse 12 says this. During my time here, this is Jesus praying to the Father. During my time here, I have protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that none was lost except the one headed for destruction, as the scriptures foretold. The same word that Jesus is using here for guarded is used many times within the New Testament. It's even used in the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament. This word is described in the infancy narrative of Luke chapter 2, verses 8, as the shepherds who are guarding their sheep, their flock, out in the night, the night Jesus was born. The shepherds were out tending to their sheep in the midst of the darkness, guarding their flocks by night. It's the same exact word, the same syntax that's used in Exodus chapter 22, 23, excuse me, verse 20, when we hear this, Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and bring you into the place that I have prepared. This is the Lord speaking now. It's the same exact word that's used by the Apostle Peter to describe actions of God preserving Noah and sealing him into the ark and keeping his family away from the day of destruction. It's the same exact word that Paul used to describe the deposit of the Holy Spirit into your lives, to guard your lives, to preserve and protect you, to seal you in. And as Paul said to the church in Thessalonica, to proclaim the Lord's faithfulness in guarding us against the evil one. So that's what Jesus is saying here as he is guarding you, as he is guarding us. He's not going to let evil come upon you. What this really means for us is that if you're with Christ Jesus and your faith is in God, and you're not working against God's will, as was Judas. Then Jesus has you. We heard a little bit about that last week. It means that not only is God in control of the situation and things that are going on in your life, it means he's also going to guard you from the devil and the forces of evil. Now let's put a parenthesis around this. It doesn't mean that hard times won't come against us. It doesn't mean that you won't suffer tribulation or persecution. That's not what this is getting at. All the disciples faced persecution. You think about our brothers and sisters across the world, especially those in the Middle East or maybe those in North Korea or in China. If you're a Christian there, it's a dangerous thing to be. You could lose your life for just speaking the name of Jesus. That's not what this is getting at. This is getting at that Jesus will guard you and protect your soul for all eternity. That's what this guarded really means. Because everyone that the Father has given him, and I have to believe that if you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that includes you. Right, If you've been sealed in the power of the Holy Spirit and you confess that Jesus is Lord, that includes you. And that means that you who God has given to Christ, that means Christ will not lose you. You're in the palm of his hand. That means when life is chaotic, just know that Jesus hasn't lost the grip of your situation and what's happening around you. And he's got you. And that means when you're feeling betrayed, that you can keep your eyes centered on Christ and the bigger picture, knowing that God's in control. And that means that even when your world looks like it's falling apart, you can keep your eyes eternally on heaven. Knowing that no matter what happens, Jesus has got you for all eternity. So 
So in the world, your world, seems a little awry. It feels chaotic. It's not going the way you want it to go or the way you expected it to go. Don't get distracted by the Judases of this world. Don't focus on the negatives or even the evil that's around us in this world. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who's the center of all things. Knowing he has you and he ain't ever going to let you go, no matter what. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let's pray for ourselves and let's pray for our brothers and sisters across the globe who are facing persecution at this time. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we love you. We believe in you. Never let us go. Help us to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and not the chaos or the betrayers in the world. Help us not to focus on the negative things that are happening around our lives, but again, to keep our eyes centered on you and on heaven, knowing that you have us, you're in control of our situation, even if we don't understand everything that's happening. Keep us, preserve us, and guard our souls through Christ. We ask the very same for our brothers and sisters throughout the world, Father God, especially those in the 1040 window. Those, Father God, who are being persecuted for their faith, who are standing trial for their faith. Those who are under scrutiny every day for being a Christian. Guard them and protect them eternally through Christ so that they will be forever yours. Keep us all. And guard us all, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.